Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name, the name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. For there's no other name I know. Come on and bless that wonderful name, the name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful the name name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. For there's no other name I know. Amen. 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 And amen again. I think I'm waiting for my volume to come out right, sister. There we go, Sister Goodwin. I can see that big smile behind that mask. Good to see everybody this morning, and welcome, welcome. And it's good to see another Lord's Day. Another day that we can come together and glorify God. Has uh, everybody received their wish this year? <laughs> Nobody got a bag of coal, did they? <laughs> well, that is good. Good to see everybody this morning. Glad that you had, uh, uh, even though it's cold, a, a chilly holiday weekend. And today we want to go ahead and pick up our lesson on boundaries and our children. And I thank God for blessing me to be able to stand before you this day. And I thank Brother Rupert for giving me the opportunity to share with you the things that I have learned and I have read with you. Now, as I said, I make a disclaimer. I'm not an expert as a parent, but I've been blessed with God's word and a faithful family to be able to have experiences and learn things that I want to share with you. Now, you may be a parent, single parent, or your children may be grown, but that does not mean you still can't stop learning how to be a parent because what you want to do is also get, gain knowledge that you can help your children be parent or someone else or brother or sister with their parenting problems because parenting children is not always going to be easy. Anybody ever had uh, children they raised there was no problem whatsoever from the birth to the time they moved out of your house and out on their own? <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Swinton. <laughs> well, see, here as parenting, children can bring challenges to you but as I said earlier before, you are a steward of your child. God gave them to you for you to train them to be responsible so that they also, not only are they responsible, but they also have a relationship with God. Because the thing about coming into this world is not for us to come in and get rich and be famous and so forth. That's fine. But the main purpose is to get our lives together so that we have that relationship with God because we're not going to be here forever. You know, the Bible says three score and ten. That's not necessarily guaranteed. And then if you can live beyond that, I mean, that's a blessing. But basically, <clears throat> our purpose here on earth is to make preparation to be in heaven with God eternity. Amen. Now, it's great when you got some, 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 some accomplishments here on earth. That's great, but that's only temporary. And sometimes we get caught up in the temporary things that we forget about the eternal things. And the same way with our children, we want to help them to develop boundaries so that they would know when to say no and sometimes when they might have to back up. 
But if they don't learn that at home, guess who's going to teach them? The world will. And see, the world cannot, uh, is not friends with us. We can be friends with the world and also have a relationship with God. Because he said, you can't serve two masters. So let's pick up where we left off and hopefully we can get a lot finished and I think that's on uh, we left on page 175 and we were talking about Jack and uh, Tyler I mean, move up. And we talked about the temperament. But here, we're going to talk about taking the responsibility for one's need. Now, the Bible teaches that we're all responsible because we all have to carry our own burden. But there are times that we have to help one another to carry that burden. But it does not mean that we ought to be an enabler. Because one thing about training your children, we want to train them to be responsible for their own needs. And so we have needs to be met. And you're going to meet your needs one or two ways. You're going to meet it godly, or you're going to meet it ungodly. But with our children, we want to train them to make their requests and their needs made, to God, made to known, known to God. Because what the Bible says, you receive not because you ask not. And God is the type of father that he wants to give you what you ask for, as long as it's not to the point that's going to take you away from him. And see, as parents, we also have to learn how to meet our children's needs without enabling them. Now, I know that's hard. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. But when our children need something, but you know that they need to work or earn it, what do you do? Do you make them earn it, or do you just automatically give it to them because that's my child? Because one thing that we don't, want to have a fear of is thinking that our children would not like us or hate us if we don't do what they ask us to do. As a parent, you ever thought about that? That I don't want my child, and I'll, I'll use this term, have an attitude towards me because I didn't do what they asked me to do. Let them pout. Let them go stomping off. But guess what? They'll come back because they realize I can't do it by myself, but I got to learn my attitude, my behavior. Because we talked about the temperaments last week, and we'll probably go back over a few of them again. But when you learn or know your child's temperament, you can help them through that moment where they get to the point where they make a wrong decision or they say the wrong thing. But to help them to understand, wait a minute, what I'm doing is wrong because one thing about you teaching them is to let them know if the Lord bless you, one day you're going to be a parent. And you can see how it continues on. If your child is raised up in a certain environment, when they get old enough, they're going to have the same environment that they grew up in. Now, I ask you this question. How many of you are in the same environment that you were that you are now, that you were when you were growing up. If it's a good environment, you want to continue that. If it was a bad environment, do you want to repeat that? Do you want your children to experience that? No, you want to make it better for them than what you had. So here, because in Philippians 4.19, God will supply well, he said, God will supply all your needs. And see, right now, we already have the main needs 
is air. You need air to breathe. You have food, water, you have a shelter, you have clothing. Those are basic needs. But then there are other needs that you may need that if you need it, just ask God. If he decides to give it to us, because some things that we need are not a needs, it's a want. And some wants won't do us very much good if we even had it. How many, how many of us want a million dollars? Two, well, I, some of us want 10. But how would you respond if you had it? You might lose your mind. But God gives us what we need so that, as Paul says, so that I'm content. Okay, Brother McKinley, <clears throat> let's pick up our reading. And let's look at page 175. I'm sorry, 174. And we're going to start with self protection. Have you ever seen anything? Have you ever seen anything more helpless than the human infant? Human babies are less able to take care of themselves than animal babies. God designed the newborn months as a means for the mother and father or another caregiver to connect deeply with their infant, knowing that without their minute-by-minute -minute care, the baby would not survive. All this time and energy translates into an enduring attachment in which the child learns to feel safe in the world. God's program of maturation, however, doesn't stop there. Mom and dad can't always be there to care and provide. The task of, excuse me, the task of protection needs to ultimately pass on to the children. When they grow up, they need to protect themselves. Okay, right there. See, we went over this last week, but just a review. Babies do not come out already equipped to do what they need to do to survive. You have to train them, because in the beginning, they're under your protection. You have to train them how to eat and eventually take care of themselves. You bathe them in the beginning, but later on, you teach them how to bathe themselves. And so because of Babies, you are the main one that they have the first contact with. So that's why even as parents, having that patient with children, because children will, they will try you. And babies don't, get me wrong when I say this, babies are smart too. They know how to control their parent. So careful when they cry. Because they say, hmm, if I cry, mommy comes in and holds me. And after a while, they train you. I shared this story with you that my mother shared with me. I wasn't old enough. I'll get to you in a minute, Brother Goodwin. And I wasn't old enough. I mean, I think I was too young to remember, but she shared it with me. When I was a, a baby and I couldn't get my way, I would hold my breath and fall out. Every time I couldn't get my way, I would hold my breath and fall out, and my mother would run over and grab me and pick me up and, and say, oh, there, 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 oh, it's going to be okay. Well, one day, we were at my grandmother's house, and I couldn't get my way, so I held my breath until I fell out. And my mother went to come to get me, and my grandmother held my mother and would not let her come and pick me up. Because, see, I had my mother trained. And after a while, she said, because I didn't come over, she didn't come over right away, she said, eventually, I got up, looked around, and realized my mother wasn't coming. She said, I never did it again. So I was training her, but 
Then my grandmother had to help train my mother. Let them fall out. Hold his breath. It won't be for long. But see, here, we train our children, but also we got to be careful that our children aren't training us. Because, see, you're the parent, and we're going to get into this. When you tell your child something, don't, it's sometimes there's no negotiation. And, and we're going to get to this, too. When is no, no? Brother Goodwin, uh, uh, can we get a mic? Yeah, that Brother Swinton, he, he'll be a mic runner. Oh, Brother Goodwin, do you have a question? I was saying, I was saying uh, also myself that a lot of, a lot of um, things that our children learn as they grow up, they just learn by watching us as parents. You know, they, children often, oftentimes don't, sometimes don't do what you say. They do what they see you do. And, and that's how... They Im Im imitate what we do. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times, you, you ain't got when you raise them up, you ain't, you ain't got to do a lot of talking to them all the time about everything. A lot of the things they, they see from us, you know, like mm -hmm. as they grow up, they uh they begin to learn. They see us, see Dad go out the house every morning, come in the evening. He coming home from work, you know, and 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 they learn that that. Moms and pops, they go down to the supermarket and buy food and bring it in the house. And they learn them same thing. They, they learn, they see moms and pops and whoever going to work every day. They, they grow up and they learn and see that they got to go to work every day mm -hmm. and, and provide themselves with the things that they need. Well, see, like I said, remember the three E's that Brother Rupert used to talk about? It's what? What's the first E? Environment, what's the second E? EX. Example, and what's the third E? Experience. And where do they all start from? In the home. So children imitate or emulate, if that's the word, their parents. Because I remember what my father used to do. I tried to walk like my father, and he's bow-legged, so I'm bow-legged. But I tried to do what he was doing around the house. And I had to be careful because my son would do the same thing. He was imitating me. I went up next to Mommy or Mimi, and I put my hand in her apron pocket. Next thing I know, he goes up, he puts his hand in her apron pocket. And so that's why I got to be careful, you know, how I hug my, you know, because they imitate their parents. And so here with our children, you can show them what is right, and they would do what is right. When the salesman comes to the, to the door, and he knocks on the door, or the rent man, and you say to your child, tell them I'm not home. <laughs> what are you teaching that child to do? How to lie. How not to be responsible. And then when they do something, now you want to chastise them, and you're confusing them because they say, well, that's what you did. That's what you were doing. And so here, that's why children are so delicate. But we got to be careful because once they get to a certain point, you know, like I said, you can't teach your old dog new tricks. After a while, they set in their ways. Now you have more challenges. Now, don't get me wrong on this. People can change. Don't think that somebody say, well, I'm like this and I always know you can change. It's just if you want to change. Because if that was the case, none of us would be here. Yeah. It's a bunch of changed people up in here. That's all in here. It is a bunch of changed people. Yeah, a bunch of changed people. That's, that's all that's in here. So let's...
That's all of me. Brother McKinley, let's go to page 177, and let's look at taking responsibility of one's needs. The group therapy session I was leading was quiet. I just asked Janice an unanswerable question. The question was, what do you need? She looked confused and became thoughtful and sat back in her chair. Janice had just described a week of painful loss. Her husband had made moves to separate, her kids were out of control, and her job was in jeopardy. The concern on the faces of the group members who were all working on issues of attachment and safety was evident. Yet no one knew, yet no one knew quite how to help. So when I asked the question, I was asking it for all of us, but Janice couldn't answer. This was typical of Janice's background. She spent most of her childhood taking responsibility for her parents' feelings, the peacemaker of the house. She was always smoothing over the ruffled feathers of either parent with soothing words like, Mom, I'm sure Dad didn't mean to blow up at you. He's had a rough day. The result of such unbiblical responsibility toward her family was clear in Janice's life. A sense of over-responsibility for others and a lack of attunement toward her own needs, Janice had radared out for the hurt of others, but the radar pointed her way was broken. It was no wonder she couldn't answer my question. Janice didn't understand her own God-given legitimate needs. She had no vocabulary for this thinking. And see here, this is where there's that situation where a person can't say no. And see, teaching our children boundaries, we got to help them to be able to say no also. Mm -hmm. And saying no helps them to not get into a situation that's going to be consequences that will follow. Now, teaching your children how to say no is helping them to understand what's right and wrong when they say no. Not teaching them to say no when you tell them to, to do something. And have you ever had a little child tell you no? No. And see, we got to be careful not give them the wrong impression because when we laugh at them, you think it's cute. But when they get older, it's no longer cute. It's to the point, you know, your hand is pulling back. But see, like I said, we got to be careful because children, as they get older, they would then want to fight back. And there's one thing that's so disrespectful is when children are fighting their parents. Now, it's one thing when they come home, your parent come home and he's stumbling and he's drunk and he comes home and fights. You know, that's the kind of background I had. But it's one thing when your parents are being a parent, but the child is being rebellious. But here still, you can still work with the child because now you have to talk to them like a counselor. What is the problem? Why are you acting like this? Why do you feel like this? Now we have to do counseling with our children because we got to find out what happened along birth to now that caused you to act like this. And like I said, it depends on their temperament. Some children, like the phlegmatic, man, they easy to parent because they just go with the flow. But then if you got a chloric or a melancholy, even a supine or the sanguine, each child is different. So learning how to parent is sometimes challenging because you don't have the same one each time. It would be easy. Wouldn't it be great if all your children were the same? So whatever you did for one, you can do for other. When you finish wearing this pair of pants, you pass it down to your brother and then so on and, and down. But it doesn't work that way because if we're not careful We'll let our children, as Janet in this state, in this story, get to the point where we're no longer able to take care of ourselves. Because now we're more concerned about others' needs than our own. 
Now, as we go further down into this, let's, let's, let's continue, uh, Brother McKinley, because one thing that we also have to have an understanding of, sometimes our need means we need some rest. We need some me time. I mean, family time is good, but also don't forget me time. And sometimes me time may mean that when your child does something that it's time for you to discipline them, take some time first. Because you don't want to go in the heat of the moment and discipline a child. You want to wait a few moments, think about it, pray about it, to make sure that when I talk to my child or discipline my child, I'm within means that it, I don't discourage the child. Because remember, especially as fathers, Ephesians 6, 4, provoke not your children under wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We have to be able to talk to them, work with them, so they don't become discouraged and frustrated or rebellious. Brother McKinnon, let's, let's go ahead and continue. The story doesn't discourage, excuse me, the story does, however, have a happy ending. One of the group members said, if I were in your shoes, I know what I need. I'd really need to know that you people in this room care for me, that you didn't see me as a colossal, shameful failure, that you'd pray for me and let me call you on the phone this week for support. Janice's eyes began watering. Something about her friend's empathetic statement touched her in a place she couldn't herself touch and she'd allow the comfort that comes from others who have been comforted to take its place inside her, 2 Corinthians 1 and 4. Jackson, Brother, hold on right there. Brother Atkins, can we bring up 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's go to verse 3, 3 and 4. And while he's doing that, Janice needs to, needed some comfort. And she needed comfort from others to help her going through what she was going through that was stressing her out. And so when we learn how to comfort one another, it'll help us, especially when God gives, you know, God gives us comfort. So the main comfort that you're going to receive is from God. But also when you receive comfort, he also expects us to comfort someone else. You ever wondered at times, you ask God, God, why am I going through this? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? And you know what he'll tell you? What I had to learn? you going through this because I'm preparing you to help someone else. So that's why we go through what we go through because we are being equipped to help someone else. Brother McKinley, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God is the God of all comfort. So when you have that relationship with God, you automatically, or you then have, okay, I got God to comfort me. And then when we let God comfort us, then in verse 4, what does that help us to do? Who comforted us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So you see how God works with the family, the church family? We go through things. We bear one another's burden. But we also help each other to come out of that, also that rut so that we can then continue to move forward. So in Janice's case, she was happy. I mean, wasn't well, happy. I don't know about it. But here, she was comforted from those in the support group the same way we are to comfort each other. Because sometimes our children will come home and they had a bad day in school. And sometimes we, we give them a hug. Or we ask them, well, how was your day in school? We talk about it. To help them to not become discouraged and come home and say, well, I don't want to go back to school anymore. Because they don't like me. Or so-and-so 
didn't talk to me today, or they called me a name. Parents have to give their children comfort when they come home because we're preparing them to take on the world because if they cannot be, if they're not prepared to, to take on challenges of the world, they'll never leave your home. And then if they do, they will not succeed once they leave home. So that's our main purpose. Our main purpose is to help our children to be equipped to be responsible adults when they leave the protection of our home. Now, I know some of us would like to keep our children home forever. And then there's others, I can't wait till you get 18. I was teaching a class one time, and I had to be careful of my words. We were talking about this. And I said, yeah, you, you know, the children are still at home and grown adults and living in the basement. And, and I'm teaching this lady this Bible class. And as we're going through the lesson, next thing I know, here come two grown men coming in the house, going upstairs to their bedroom. And I said, oh, my goodness. I done offended this lady big time. That was my first and last Bible class because she was, did not allow her sons to become responsible adults, responsible men to go out and take care of their family. So here, with Janice's case, also, she needed to take a break from some of the stress that her parents her husband, her family were putting on her. So let's continue Janice's story. Janice's story illustrates the second fruit of boundary development in our children. The ability to take ownership of or responsibility for our own needs. God intends for us to know when we're hungry, lonely, in trouble, overwhelmed, or in need of a break, and then to take initiative to get what we need. The scriptures present Jesus as understanding this point when he left a crowd of people in a boat in a time of great ministry and need. Because so many people were coming and going that he and his disciples did not even have a chance to eat, Mark 6 and 31. So here, even Jesus took a break. Because here, they, they didn't have a chance to eat, so you need a break. Matthews 11, 28 and 30. Because we have to understand that we have to trust that if we take a day off, the world would not stop turning. And everything would be okay. But it takes faith. So we have to believe that just because I don't come to the church building, the lights aren't going to get turned on. It takes faith that we have to trust those who are in position and so that we don't feel like the whole weight is on us. I know sometimes we, we, we get like that. You know, if I don't go to work, the company's going to fold. Don't go to work that day and see if the company folds. We have to believe that we're not supermen and superwomen. Okay? We need to take a break because even Jesus took a break. So if the Son of God takes a break, why are we trying to outdo him and just keep going to the point where we just fall over? You ever experienced that where you work so hard you just pass out? Your health is important. Your mental health is important as well as your physical health. But see, boundaries play a primary role in this process. Brother McCain, let's continue. Boundaries play a primary role in, in this process. Our limits create a spiritual and emotional space, a separateness between ourselves and others. This allows our needs to be heard and understood. Without a solid sense of boundaries, it becomes difficult to filter out our needs from those of others. There is so much static in the, in the relationship. When children can be taught to experience their own needs as opposed to those of others, they have been given a genuine advantage in life. 
they are able to better avoid the burnout that comes from not taking care of oneself. How can we help our children experience their own individual needs? The best thing a parent can do is to encourage verbal expression of those needs, even when they don't go with the family flow. When the children have permission to ask for something that goes against the grain, even though they might not receive it, they develop a sense of what they need. And see here, the author is saying, we need to get our children to talk to us. And see, the thing about it, when you have that relationship with your child, you want them to not be afraid to talk to you. And see, if in certain situations, one parent might be able to be easily approached by the child to talk to where the other parent may not. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but think about it. How many of us were closer to our mother and talking about things that were bothering us than we were with our father and vice versa? And see, in some homes, you can't talk to the father because the father said, what? You did what? And it get to the point you would feel afraid to even speak because now my father is going to chastise me verbally. And if, he, if I continue, it might be physically too. Where it'd be easy to talk to mom because mom always has that compassion. It's going to be okay. But here, learn how to talk to the children by going over some of the suggestions that they have below. Let's continue, Brother McKinley. Below are some ways you can help your children. Allow them to talk about their anger. Let's do one at a time. Allow them to talk about their anger. You ever see your child walking around, they got their lip poked out and wind in the jaws? Well, here, ask them, what's wrong? Why are you angry? And they'll tell you why they're angry, because maybe they didn't get their way, or maybe their toy broke, or maybe they can't go outside to play. But allow them to talk about their anger. And sometimes parents, and I, and I know I'm guilty of this, we're swift to speak and slow to listen. But we got to reverse that. We got to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Give them an opportunity to s express their feelings. Let's continue. Allow them to express grief, loss, or sadness without trying to cheer them up and talk them out of their feelings. Now right there, let, let them express it. Let them get it all out. And see, this applies also to adults in a marriage relationship. Because, see, women like to talk. Men like to fix it. There are times where the wife don't want you to fix it. She just wants you to let her talk. Where with husband, What's wrong? I got it. I'll take care of it. No, I don't want you to take care of it. I want you to listen to what I have to say or how I feel. And children are the same way. Let them express themselves. And then sometimes when you let them express themselves, they'll come to their own conclusion at the end. But you won't get it if you try to sort of hinder them or take care of the problem. You don't give them a chance to come out of that cocoon. Let them come out of that eggshell, but they got to come out with a little bit of struggle in the meantime because it would give them strength to handle the next thing that's going to come in their lives. Okay, bro, let's continue. Encourage them to ask questions and not assume your words are the equivalent of Scripture. This takes a pretty secure parent. Continue. Ask them what they are feeling, and when they seem isolated or distressed, help them to put words to their negative feelings. Do not try to keep things light for a false sense of cooperation and family closeness. That's where it says, train up a child in the way he should go. At this time, brother, I'm in class, make yourself prepared for 
collection. Plus, you can go ahead for it. Train up a child in a way that she, he should go. And when he gets old, he won't depart from it. Let them be able to talk about what they're going through, but then helping them to understand what's right and what's wrong. And then as they do that, they want to be able to have confidence that I can go to my parent and talk about what's bothering me without my parents condemning me. You know, I'll, I'll share this. When, when I go to talk to my father, which I couldn't do, before I can get my sentence out, he's already condemning me for what I was saying or what I had done. And then one time, he would surprise me. I did something that I shouldn't have done, and I expected my father was going to hit the roof because I knew my mother was calm. But it happened, it was the reverse. My father was calm, and my mother hit the roof. Now, that was a little shock to me because my mother, I always thought, would always be the one that said, it's going to be all right, it's going to be okay. But I had to learn that because of my action, I disappointed my mother. And see, sometimes when you talk to your children, don't let them feel that if I continue this, I'm going to disappoint my parent. No, you want your child to, exp to explain or to express themselves so that you can help them to understand right and wrong. What you did, yes, was wrong. What you did, yes, it's consequences. But what you did does not take away my love for you. And what I mean by that, that's the same way God is with us. How many of us uh, have committed a sin? Now, don't, don't raise your hand now. I don't want nobody in, you know, to the point that it was a sin that you should not have done. But God still loves us and still will forgive us when we repent. It's the same way with our children. Sometimes our children can get on our last nerve, but we still love them because, as, as it says, we want to be able to hate the sin, but God loves the sinner. And it's the same way with our children. I love you as my child, but I don't like what you did. And explain that to them so that they understand that I won't do that again and also to have the ability to think about what you do before you do it. You know, careful with your child's temperament. Some children have the impulse, they don't think at all, they just, phew, gone. And then when it's over with, then they cry and say, yeah, I know it's wrong, but you didn't think. Think before you act. And it leads into your adulthood also. Sister Goodwin. Wait a minute, let me get a mic for you. Brother Goodwin. I, I, I got Sister Goodwin. Got her. Brother Good, how does that apply to adult children? Same thing. You know, sometimes your adult children are just like a child, and you're still going to have to bring them up out of that childish behavior into the adult state. Because to be honest, some of our adult children are still, well, they're still children to us, but they are now adults. So it's the same way as your adult child. You still got to have to have that patience let me hear what you have to say. And I, got, and I, I know you, 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 you cringe and say, but let them, let them talk. And then, as the Bible says, a soft voice will turn away wrath. So, and, and I, I'm, I'm guilty. I, 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 I repent. Sometimes it's not, my voice ain't soft. just thinking about when you said, you know, don't 
condemn them. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're just going to take it that way because what they did is just wrong. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, you are instructed by God to tell them when they are wrong. Mm -hmm. So she is angry with me, she's upset with me, and I don't care. Because I feel like, especially when it's a repeat thing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she just keeps doing it, and I'm like, you know, and you knew that that was wrong. Okay, and let me ask you a question. And, go ahead. Let me ask you a question, we're uh -huh. in counseling now. Mm -hmm. okay. Have you told her you love her? All the time. And keep telling her that, because even though her action is what it is, as long as she knows that you love her, you'd be surprised that a turning point in a child will come around. Yeah. All that I did, my mother still loved me. Mm -hmm. All that we do have done, mm -hmm. God still loves us. Mm -hmm. Right. And some of us are just like your child, mm -hmm. always getting into something, always doing something, but God still loves us the same way with, with your child. Keep that in front of her. I love you. But also keep that parenting in front of her. Your behavior is unacceptable. And it's unacceptable. But continue to say, I love you, but I'm not going to tolerate and accept your behavior. And then you tell her the consequences. Either you listen to mother or mommy, or you're going to listen to the courts. One of them is going to straighten you out. So you give them choice. Which do you want? You okay on that? <laughs> All right, uh, Sister Mur uh, Murphy, uh, before you, um, Sister Aaron, right behind you, brother. Brother Good, I think that it seems if, if, if there's a problem... Okay, uh, put the mic a little closer to you. So I think if there's a problem and you know that there's a problem and the child is wrong, um, you still have to maintain your integrity and your, your spirit has... Don't close your spirit and that attitude has got to be right with you because they know when your attitude ain't right too. So as you're trying to correct whatever the, the wrong is, you still got to have your spirit right because you can't mm -hmm. help the child if you're angry to the point where they can see it. And also, once you really believe that you've done all you can in that situation, where is God? God has to play, do his part in it, where you got to turn it over to God at some point mm -hmm. and allow God to work with you to help the child to get through it. Mm -hmm. And see, sometimes, even though the child may be angry at you, do not let that cause you to give in to the child. Because, see, children will try to use that against you. You don't like me anymore. Or when they get angry at you and they say, I don't like you. I hate you. Okay. As you said, you keep on being a parent. And then when they come to say, is it time to eat? Oh, you don't like me, right? I didn't fix you nothing. <laughs> Sometimes you lose a, use a little psychology on them. And you'll see them I remember one time I, I was so mad at my mother, I, I said, I'm running away from home. I got my wagon, packed it up with all my personal toys, no washcloth, no toothpaste, no toothbrush, no change of clothes, just my toys. And I put it in my wagon. I'm mad. I'm running away from home. I ran as far to the end of the backyard. That's as far as I got. When I realized and started thinking, I said, wait a minute. It's going to be dark soon. It's going to be dinner soon. I have no money. I pulled my little wagon back home. <laughs> Sister Murphy. I just wanted to say, uh -uh. that is why prayer is so important. Mm -hmm. Let your children hear you pray for them. Pray with them it constantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll know that you really love them, and maybe that'll make a change in them. Mm -hmm. And see, it's so important with their prayer. Sister Garner. 
um, Brother Good, I wanted to give you this example. Can you put it down just a little bit more? I wanted to give you this example where um, Chantel, when she was coming up, and her school had the uniforms. It was around the holiday, Christmas holiday. Went to the store. She got her, her clothes that she wanted, but I had some, the, some uniform, the skirts, but she didn't want those skirts. She went in there, and I told her, I said, I want you to decide. You, can, you take these skirts, or if you don't take the skirts, you don't get this. Mm -hmm. And she had a lot of stuff now. And she kept, she, I said, now you go in there and think about it. I said, because we're going to leave. And she came back out and she said she didn't want, she didn't want it. So on that day, we were on our way back to um, Wednesday Bible study. Got on the parking lot and I sat there in the car with her. And I had to ask her, can you ask, can you explain to me why would you turn away this because you don't want the skirts that you know you have to have for school? And she just, she didn't think I was going to walk out the store. Mm. That's what she mm. told me. Because I told her she wasn't getting anything. And I kept my word. But what I told her, we are going back to get those skirts but you're not getting those clothes. Mm -hmm. And she did not get it for the holiday. Only thing she got that next year was a coat. Mm -hmm. And see, here, you let her know you're the parent. That's right. And see, sometimes our children think that, and, and in your case, you have the one child. Sometimes the number one child think, I'm number one on everything. But you did what we had just read in the book earlier, about the little girl didn't want to go to the dentist and say, I'm not going. But the parent knows for your benefit, you need to go to the dentist. But then you give that child a choice. If you don't go to the dentist, then you don't go to the party. And then when they start weighing it, they said, you know what, I want to go to the party, but I really don't want to go to the dentist. But I'm going to go to the dentist because I want to go to the party. Now, sometimes they have that attitude earlier, but later on they thank you that you helped them to see they need to go to the dentist because they still got their teeth, no cavities, but they don't see it in the beginning. And see, sometimes children don't see it now, but then they see it later. It's the same thing I told my parents. I, you know, how many of us say, you, don't you raise your hand? How many of us have said to ourselves, my parents don't know nothing? <laughs> they, 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 they not up to the latest this and that in the world. My parents don't know nothing. I said that until I became a parent. And I said, my parents were right. And see, sometimes when we don't give our children everything that they need, or that they not need, want, they would then appreciate you later when you didn't do that. They said, okay, I appreciate it then. And see, that's the same way when I fell out and held my breath. I only had to do it one time. You never have that problem again. Brother Stewart. Brother Good. I take your mask down, brother, so I can hear you clearly. <clears throat> brother Good, one of the best examples for me when I was young it's like I said, I come from a huge family. And, and, and as a young child, like five, six, or seven years old, I seen my fa father whip two of my older brothers because they was fighting. And he always told us, you know what I mean, not to do that. But the way he whipped them, Every time he hit him with that whip, brother, all I seen was a knot in blood. I was scared to death. And I said, yeah, well, I ain't going to fight my brother that's next to me. You couldn't make me put my hand on him if I'm going to get some of that. But then what I seen that night was at quarter to nine every night. Because I used to, it used to confuse me. I said, boy, my father mean. He told me he must don't like them the way he beat them, right? 
But then that night at quarter to nine, when he had us all on our knees, praying to God, thanking God for another day, and I would hear my father talk about how thankful he was to God that he didn't, that God blessed my children, his children, not to get hurt or do nothing foolish or cause any harm to anybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sitting here looking to myself, I'm saying to myself, wow, is this the same man that I just saw earlier today draw blood from these kids? You know what I mean? But he really do love them. And you see, I mean? sometimes and, parents... And that was a good example for me. Right, and see, the children need to know that the parents love them, but not to that extreme because, like I said, he only probably did with his children as he was, that his father had done to him. And then sometimes it changed because, see, you didn't raise or treat your children like your father did. And that's the same in my home. I could not bring myself to discipline my children for stension cord. But that's how he grew up, and then that's how we as parents have to teach our children this is what parenting God's way is about. Okay, class, Brother Goodman went over again. Okay, we're going to stop right here. And Lord's will, uh, we want to talk next week about birth order and temperament again and also the stages of parenting your child and training your child. So you've been a good class this morning. Appreciate your comments and, and your input. So at this time, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time in prayer. We thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings you've given us this day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us to come together to study and to learn about boundaries in our children. We pray, Heavenly Father, you bless us, dear God, as parents and those who are uh, are raising young ones and those who are now grandparents. Help us, Lord, with wisdom to be able to talk to our children, to train our children that is pleasing in your sight. Help us, dear God, as a congregation that we love one another, that we are one as a body. Be with us, dear God. We pray for those who are grieving, grieving at this time, especially in the loss of a loved one, we pray to God that you bless this congregation, bless our minister and our ministries that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Beautiful Lord, as we're about to go into our morning worship service, keep us always in your love and in your care. In your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in my life. The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to the Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. Jesus loves you, this we know.